Hi folks, welcome back to Let's Be Sleeved. Okay, so this is the third video. And today I'm gonna to be talking about mental preparation for surgery. And uh, so already I've done an intro video and a little bit more about like planning for some of the food and sort of phasing out my pre-op diets because I will be doing a liquid, uh, an all liquid diet for three weeks because I am doing a lap band to sleeve revision surgery they need me to have less inflammation and they need to have more space to work and it's just really it's just their hoop to jump through so I'm gonna follow their guidelines to a T um, quick recap I had lap band surgery uh, about 12 and a half years ago for the first five years I maintained a 150 pound loss um, I should say that I had lost 25 pounds previous to surgery so it's all all good I guess it all counts right um, for five years maintained 150 pound weight loss then um, started doing IVF and had to be on hormones and steroids at the same time plus drugs for managing uh, mood stabilization because we were a having a rough time and B we were they're having a very rough time with IVF because we were experiencing multiple pregnancy losses the minute I, those hair those hormones and steroids hit my system Oh my God, like within four or five days, you know, like first of all, you have that water weight, but it was just like, I was piling up the pounds and there was just, there was nothing I could do about it. So then I gained about 20 pounds. I was okay with it because I knew that like real life happens and these pounds were a badge of honor and I knew I was healthy. So I just tuned out all the noise and I just focused on trying to get through an extremely stressful period and get a baby. I had my first kid and I gained 10, 10 pounds, yeah. And so then I was 10 pounds heavier. And similarly, I was like, you know what? I'm in my late 30s, almost, I was almost 40 at the time. Whatever, you know what? So I'm 30 pounds heavier than when I had uh, my original lap band low. Life goes on as long, I could, as long as I could look myself in the mirror and say, you are eating really well and you're exercising and you're taking care of yourself. I didn't care. I don't really care about arbitrary numbers that other people make up for me. All I'll listen to is my body. So then, moving along with life, I'm trying to get comfortable here, I'm like on the edge of my bed. Moving along with life, I get pregnant with number two. Number two, I have something called hyperemesis gravidarium. For those of you not familiar, it is basically hell on earth. So I went from being a normal person to vomiting and 24 hour constant nausea dehydration in and out of the hospital feeding tubes the whole nine yards and of course I had my band unfilled immediately because you know violent it's not even like the like the nice vomiting where you're just like poof, feels good, good it was like that violent wrenching vomiting where you're pissing and shitting yourselves like it is it is a common fact in the HG community that most of the time when you're vomiting, you're usually going to be losing your bowels because it's such a violent sort of vomiting. So as you can imagine, not because I'm gross. Well, actually, I am gross, but anyway, <laughs> I have a five-year-old boy. <laughs> of course I'm gross. Um, but if you can imagine, like, the force that it would take to make you piss or shit yourself while you're vomiting, imagine what that's doing to your stomach. I had tons of stomach damage. And I actually ended up losing weight after I gave birth. It didn't look like it. I maintained the same 210 and then all hell broke, broke loose. My eating disorder basically just like, after years of lying dormant, or rather switching into anorexia mode, let's be honest here, it came back into binging. And so for a couple months, for two months, I decided I'm gonna do this thing called All In. It's supposed to help you recover from an eating disorder by just completely removing restriction and saying, head, you're out of a job, body, you make the decisions. And it actually did end any of that binging behavior I had. The other reason why I was binging though is because I was hungry. So nine months of malnutrition and years of malnutrition prior. And it wasn't the worst malnutrition, but you know how it is when you're just constantly on a diet, which I was, which was how I was able to maintain a 120 pound weight loss. So then that leads me to here. So I gained about 60 pounds when I stopped dieting and um, the first two months I was absolutely eating every shitty thing that I had not let myself eat for a decade. And still, like, I don't regret it. It's something I sort of had to do. I had to know what happens when I stop dieting. Because I couldn't use the band anymore because it was shot. 
now I had all these complications and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and I didn't want to be binge restrict cycle. So right now I don't binge, I don't restrict, um, but I'm fat <laughs> and I don't like it. Um, after a decade of being thin um, or thinner, you know, like a size 10, 12 in that range, 8, 10, 12 was usually my range. I, um, I don't enjoy being in this new body and I don't enjoy it for a couple of reasons. I'll do a video about that, but the, the biggest one is, is I have a lot of physical pain that is completely related to weight gain. And it's especially because I gained a lot of weight really quickly. Um, it just, I think, you know, like your body is just kind of like, whoa, what the fuck just happened? You're just, you went from like, you know, a size 10 to a size 18. I'm a size 18 if that, you know, helps you with your figuring out where you are to in comparison to where I am. Although we should not compare, we should never compare. It is the feast of joy. Any uh, so here we are. I am hoping to go to Mexico in about a month and a half, which is where I had my first lap band. And I am, so not new to the rodeo, I am thinking about the, the prep. And I think when you've had, when you're thinking about, you know, surgery for the first time for weight loss, you immediately start thinking about the food. What am I going to eat? What can't I eat? What kind of protein powders will I get? Um, all of those things. And of course, I thought about all of that too, and that's really what my last video was about. But what you should be thinking about is the emotional prep. And, you know, because your surgeon is not a psychologist, and you might not be seeing a psychologist, but that's probably the thing that you should most be looking into. And uh, I speak from experience. Um, so this time around, I am actively seeing a counselor. I wanted to make sure that that was all set up. I'm always in and out of counseling anyway, so I was like, all right, let's just do this. Um, so that was all set up way prior anyway. Um, and uh, I'm trying to get back into journaling. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, so sometimes that me time is lacking, but I'm really making that a priority because I find for myself that talking to people helps me process what I'm feeling and writing more so. So that is my biggest, my two biggest ways that I am mentally preparing myself for this latest round of surgery. The other way that I'm preparing myself, aside from, of course, that pre-op diet, which again, I really think is not so much about, here's my personal theory. You go to five different people who've had any kind of bariatric surgery and all of their surgeons will have this like, as if it was written from God that thou must do this, thou must lose this amount of weight, thou cannot have sweet potatoes, thou can only do this, thou can only eat clean, da 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 da. And the rationale always being they want to reduce infl inflammation and make it easier for them to move around in your um, in your body and move your liver out of the way, etc, etc, etc. But why are there like 30,000 different versions of that? Because really it's about seeing if you can jump through that hoop, if you can get into that diet. And it really kind of primes you for the fact that if you think the pre-op diet is, you know, annoying and restrictive, you're going to live the rest of your life like this. It's not going to be as severe as the pre-op diet because you're going to feel a lot less hunger if the surgery is successful for you. So it's actually some, in some ways easier than the pre-op diet. But it means then that it's kind of priming you mentally for like, if you don't like completely changing your life and making your consumption of food really mechanical and regimented, then you really need to think about how you're going to cope. It doesn't, <laughs> and I would I hasten to add that nobody likes it. It's more about having an honest conversation with yourself of can you long term live with how restrictive the new reality is going to be for you. I know what I'm walking into and I know it's hard. It's not hard in the honeymoon phase. Like when, you know, like until you're, you, you're usually losing really rapidly. That first year is almost like a blur because it's like, boom, I'm thin. What the fuck happened? And then all of a sudden it gets a little bit more challenging as you're going, you're getting into like your straight sizes. Like it's almost like once you get past Wonderland, your body starts to usually, depending on where you start, but most of us are big gals, right? Your body starts to kind of tamp down on the weight loss and things start to slow down. Things get a little more complicated, but at the same time you're riding a high, et cetera, et cetera. By years 
three, four, five. The tool is there and hopefully, as we now know, the lap band failed for a lot of people. For whatever reason, it didn't until much later for me. But um, it's doing something and it might not, it won't be as effective as when you first had the surgery, but it will still be doing something there in the background. So it's up to you to use it. And it is not easy, you know, like in the, you know, in a day, you have a million decision points and now and right now i can guarantee you before surgery yes you're thinking about food and weight and da 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 da, da but you won't be thinking about it nearly as much as you will be in the future um you're going to be making a bunch of decisions all the time and it's all those little decisions that add up and that's kind of intimidating and so that's why it takes some you know some mental uh emotional pre-op work to get yourself really comfortable with that idea and that's why again i started this channel to talk about some of the nuance and the dichotomies of you know knowing that in any other t space place time that would be called an eating disorder right like if i was a size six and i told you uh, or you were a size six and i told you you're going to start obsessing about food all the time you're going to have to have safe foods and you're going to have to come up with strategies to healthify old favorites because no you can't have chicken with gravy or if you do you're really only going to have a very small amount a couple of times a year like it's you know like you're not gonna what your family is eating or those when you go out to eat like your your way of being around food is going to change and the way that most people frame it in the weight loss surgery world is like kind of like that Jillian Michaels, like, I'm going to kick your ass and you're going to love it and tough love and da, da 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 To me, that doesn't work. And to me, that's a lie. Because realistically, if in, in the real world, if you were a size six, you wouldn't have to do all of this. And if you were doing all of this, people would be concerned for you and say you have an eating disorder. And so that's why I'm trying to have like a bit more of a, a nuanced conversation about all this. So counseling and journaling are my two ways of preparing myself. My third way that I didn't really have to think about in the past, and it's going to be a challenge for me, frankly, is the fact that I have two little people and I'm trying to raise them to not have the fucked up relationship with food and weight and body image that I have. And so I'm really going to need to compartmentalize the fact that I will now have a stomach the size of a toddler, so yay! <laughs> we can all eat goldfish together and throw them on the floor. No, <laughs> but really, like, so if you, you have young children or you remember back in the day when you had young children, you have like a little toddler coming over to you and putting goldfish in your mouth or something like that. I can't do that. I will have to like not let them do it or spit it out or something like that. And I won't be able, especially the first year, you're, you know, you're pretty restricted in A, the kinds of foods you can eat and B, the, um, the, the size. And let me tell you, people notice and children notice like how you eat and they're supposed to notice they're supposed we're supposed to be guides for them um and i already have a healthy diet so they already see me eating tons of fresh fruit and veggies my favorite thing to eat is any kind of a bean related thing i just think beans are amazing i this whole keto thing would not work for me because when i want to have some fruit i want to have some fruit and anyone who tells me in any diet that says i can't eat beans can go fuck itself because i love beans i said it <laughs> But my kids are going to see me eating liquids and straining soups and having mostly protein shakes and microwave lean cuisines and all of that. And so I really need to compartmentalize what's going on in my head and what I'm doing and make sure that the messaging, because like, yeah, I mean, like in my head, I'm thinking, I'm telling them there are no good or bad foods. There's, this is energy foods. Let's eat our energy foods. Let's make sure that we have a variety of foods. And yes, you can have these like silly, you can have a marshmallow or whatever, but I'm not having things like that anymore. So it creates a little bit of a schism of like, I'm saying one thing to them and I'm doing another. And I have to be really careful about how I compartmentalize that for myself and how I message that. For some people that wouldn't be too much of an issue. They wouldn't feel too uncomfortable with it. But for me, that sense of integrity of like, I say what I do and I do what I say, it doesn't quite line up in this case. And especially for that first year or so. 
and just being able to acknowledge that from the outset for myself try to limit the damage or the mixed messages that I'm giving to them and acknowledge to myself that again this is a season of life I will be able to eat a greater variety of foods after the first year and I will be able to model because the first year is not necessarily the best nutrition like and you're trying to lose weight as quickly as possible and I'm sorry for those people who say you can have optimum nutrition in the first year. How the fuck are you having optimum nutrition when you can barely eat a thousand calories? Let's stop fucking lying about this and get real about it. So later on, yes, you can definitely take control of things and, and maximize things for yourself and figure out what works. But really, you know, that first little while, it's kind of a weird way. You're a weirdo. You're eating weird stuff in weird ways in order to lose weight and I just want to make sure that I'm not modeling that to my kids and that where they see those things I'll really have to make sure that I'm compartmentalizing what I need to do for this season of my life and but making sure that they're still getting messages that there are no good or bad foods we love our energy foods but we also like a treat every now and then we like those those fun foods so yeah, um, if you have kids and you're, you know, doing this as well, I'd love to hear, you know, where you're at and how you kind of message it to them and like what your kids have noticed, what they haven't noticed, how, like, cause my two year old loves to feed me, loves it. And of course it's mostly, you know, like toddler food, right? So like, and even still like even with a lap band if you eat a grape in the beginning i remember it took me almost a year two years to be able to eat something like grapes so like she'll be shoving them into my mouth and right now you put five blueberries in my mouth i don't care it's no big deal for me but post-surgery especially if i'm on my liquids and stuff like that can't do it so it's kind of a, an interesting thing so i'd love to hear what other parents are you know noticing and other things that you're noticing like that's just me kind of like spitballing like how, what are the kids gonna notice? How is my decision going to impact them? What have you noticed that your kids have noticed? What are some of the things, the, the pitfalls that you didn't even anticipate? Like, how do they feel? I've only ever had to worry about myself and my husband. How do your kids feel? Your little people, because they, you know, like they they want that cuddliness, they love you, that your body is an anchor to them. How did your kids feel um, when you lost weight? Um, what kind of funny comments did you get? Like what, let me know. I'd be really interested to hear what, um, what that was like for you. All right. So like, subscribe, whatever all the YouTube people say, do all of that or don't because it's all good and I like you anyway. And if you are due for surgery anytime soon, wishing you a lot of luck and hoping that your transition to surgery is as easy as possible. I'll be back soon. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.